Hello and thank you for joining us today for this Onc Live Peer Exchange panel discussion on personalizing therapy for advanced prostate cancer. Treatment of castration-resistant prostate cancer has become increasingly complex, not only because of the number of novel therapies available with distinct mechanisms of action, but because of the lack of comparative data or validated predictive markers to help guide choice of therapy. However, there is light at the end of the tunnel. As new platforms for molecular testing continue to emerge, we are entering an era of more personalized therapy. Moreover, the paradigm is changing from one of therapeutic sequencing to one of therapeutic layering. In this OncLive Peer Exchange series, I'm joined by a distinguished multidisciplinary panel of experts. Together, we will help you to navigate the most recent information regarding diagnosis and management of metastatic prostate cancer. I'm Raul Concepcion, and I'm the director of the Comprehensive Prostate Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Joining me in this distinguished panel to share their perspectives are Dr. Michael Carducci, Professor of Oncology and Urology, and Agon Professor in Prostate Cancer Research and Associate Director for Clinical Research at the Sidney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center of Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Glenn Gedgerman, Co-Director of Urologic Oncology and Medical Director of Tomotherapy at the John Thur Cancer Center in Hackensack, New Jersey. Dr. Neil Shore, Medical Director at the Carolina Urologic Research Center in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and Dr. Evan Yu, Professor of the Department of Medicine of the Division of Oncology at the University of Washington School of Medicine, and Clinical Trials Director of Genitourinary Oncology at the Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Center in Seattle, Washington. Thank you for joining us, and let's begin. So in this first segment, we're going to discuss new data relating to hereditary prostate cancer. So, Evan, um, you know, it it's sort of has always historically been that, especially as urologists, we've really only concentrated on family histories of prostate cancer, recognizing that they are at an increased risk, as well as patients who are African American. What sort of data has sort of come out over the past year to sort of change the thinking that our audience needs to sort of focus in on? Yeah, there's been a lot of data that has recently come out to point towards the fact that there's a lot more germline alterations in patients with prostate cancer. Namely, the studies have been done focusing on patients with metastatic prostate cancer, uh, but they found that a lot of patients, up to about close to 12% of patients with metastatic prostate cancer, will have germline alterations. That means they inherit it, and it's in every single cell in their body that they inherit up to 12% will have them in homologous recombination deficiency genes. So there's a lot of different genes on that panel, but these basically are genes that are involved in DNA repair. So when you get damage to your cells, to the DNA, these are involved in DNA repair. And there are some classic genes that I think most of us are familiar with. Uh, uh, most commonly, we think about BRCA2, BRCA1, uh, but there's a whole list of other genes that are important, ATM, CHECK2, et cetera. Now, they're not all create equal, and we don't really understand uh, just how important each one is uh, into the development and progression of prostate cancer, uh, but these are genes that clearly can be inherited and can predispose to the risk of, of prostate cancer, and it can be really up to 12%, at least in the metastatic disease patients that we've seen. I think it's been a real change because people ask how, how did I get this and is it in my family, what do I tell my children? And I think this data helps, but they're still not telling us why they got prostate cancer. These are pretty common mutations in cancer, uh, and so from that perspective, it's a still a very small percentage of patients who have a hered hereditary, hereditated or passed on cancer. So Mike, for the audience, can you, can you differentiate, because again, I think people kind of hear these terms and everybody's sort of focusing on sort of their, their genetic uh, predisposition. So again, for, you know, for our audience, differentiate what is a somatic mutation versus a germline mutation. Yeah, 
I think uh, Evan started to do very well with germline, that it's sort of, that you're born with it, it's in every cell, it's sort of going to be with you through uh, from the beginning to the end, whereas somatic are things that happen over time, uh, particularly in tumor cells, if they mutate, they can mutate again, and there's uh, an ongoing process that whether our therapies affect that or just uh, the environment, uh, but multiple hits occur over time. Neil, you've been sort of involved in this, you know, specifically over the past couple of years. How is, uh, you know, what are your patients when they're, you know, when they're coming in as this information begins to proliferate? And we see obviously a lot more advertisements about companies offering genetic testing. What, what sort of been, has been your experience as, as the patients come in and talk to you about this? So interestingly, uh, I mean, um, frankly, very few patients are asking once they're diagnosed about their uh, hereditary risk of prostate cancer for their offspring, uh, their first degree, second degree uh, relatives. Um, what I've started doing now on my own because of my interest in this is getting a much better and more detailed history that I never historically did, that I never learned to do in medical school or residency. And this is incredibly important because these DNA repair mechanism defects, uh, when found, oftentimes herald a more aggressive disease, a disease that's more likely to convert from androgen sensitive to castration resistant, and, and really it, it predicts a, a, a worsening risk for mortality. The flip side to this is when you have somebody who particularly has germline um, there is a worry that this can be affecting their uh, members of their family. And there's a, a, uh, other um, syndromes where if there is a, a risk of having, or if there's documentation of breast cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, male breast cancer as well as female breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, that um, first degree and even to some degree second degree offspring are at higher risk for getting these uh, malignancies. So what's troubling to me is that um, I've done a really poor job historically about getting that uh, in-depth in family history. So I haven't done a good job of counseling my patients who would have this risk. Uh, additionally, as we get to more treatment of CRPC patients who might have somatic defects as opposed to the germline, there's also some potential for better counseling that we could be doing. So the conference that you alluded to, which I think was incredibly important, uh, there were a lot of great messages, and, and we can talk more about some of these unmet needs, but one of the biggest things to me was the nascency of where we are, especially in urology. We're, we're, we're just at the beginning of the beginning. We have to do a much better job. There's a lot of challenges to it, and, and we can talk about it. I'd love to hear Mike and, and Evan's thoughts about genetic counseling, the accessibility to that, who, who, always, who should be tested, and what do you do with that information. But it, quite frankly, it all starts with do, getting a better family history, and then referring patients for getting the, who should be tested and getting the counseling. Yeah, I think both uh, Eric and uh, Evan have uh, said two important points. Uh, one is, you know, better family histories and knowing who to test. And, and again, as a medical oncologist, I see folks later in the course of disease. And so I want to know for reasons about therapy options, I may have better options for them if I know that they've got these germline or somatic mutations. And yet, if I really am looking and I find a germline mutation, that has implications for the family. Uh, so how far do I go? Does the patient want to know? Does he want to know for his family? Uh, so this has all been worked out in breast cancer, and so I think what Neil brings up is, you know, we're not trained to sort of provide that information, and it's easy if you test it and they're negative, oh, there's no risk for that kind of thing. But if they're positive, it real has meaning for their family. Yeah, and I'll just echo the whole family history issue. Um, I think traditionally in the field of urologic oncology, we might, if we do a family history, we might ask, do you have a family history of any GU malignancies, prostate, bladder cancer, that sort of thing, but, you know, breast cancer. I bet most people don't ask about it. Ovarian cancer, you know, GI malignancies. A lot of these can travel in some of these, uh, you know, families that have uh, germline alterations. And so it's really, really important for us to all work better to improve family history. So that's something that we can work on and do right now. I think the second component there um, is a greater challenge. It's just that uh, I think we all realize that there is a, a shortage of uh, gen trained genetic counselors in this country. And to adequately counsel a patient before you do germline testing 
uh, requires that you talk about all the implications, the ethical implications, potential financial insurance implications, uh, implications for all the family members, not just implications for therapy, which we oftentimes think about as medical oncologists because there are potential implications for therapies, uh, uh, and we could talk more about that later, but the whole familial thing is something that we as a field, we have to get together and work better to figure out just how we're gonna get this done. I mean, we don't have all the answers yet.